welcome to Deja Vu, the Ethical Weekly Review podcast. I'm your host, Jake Leary, and I am here today with Antonio Fermi and Aiden Lentz. We're going to talk about Spider-Man, hence all of the gross mouth noises and aggressive hand gestures that we just made. Uh, yeah, Into the Spider-Verse, an animated Sony movie uh, starring a whole bunch of Spider-Man and something that I never expected to exist because it is very weird. Yeah. Um, is, am I wrong in thinking this is their follow-up to the Emoji movie? I think this is the next movie they made, uh, Sony Animated Pictures. Somebody fact check us on that. Yeah, um, it really could be true. <sighs> don't ruin it for me, Aiden. No, don't no ruin what I'm <laughs> saying, it's, it's the best like bounce back that, is, that you could have as a studio. I mean, yeah, probably. Yeah, where it was a meme how like hated the movie was generally by like critics, audiences, and the internet at large. And now they have like this lovely, critically acclaimed, beloved by fans already movie um, that makes a lot of brave storytelling choices. Uh, is the first project for uh, Phil Lord and Christopher Miller after they were fired. Uh, it's a good comeback story for them as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's in a way, it's almost fitting that such an underdog of a studio uh, that made so many bad choices uh, is made has made such a great thing. It's very Spider-Man of them. It, it is very Spider-Man of them. It's and a good comeback from Venom. I, you uh, know, I forget. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, you, don't you mean it's a great two run, uh, one two punch of great movies? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And yeah. This is very different from Venom. Very uh, different. Thank God. Yeah. Uh, even though been great to have Tom Hardy in this movie, though. I would have appreciated a reference to that, even though they cover a lot of other ground. But oh, before, God, yeah. Yeah. Before we go completely into this, just so people understand what this movie is, uh, and before we spoil everything about it, you know, you've been warned. Um, this is a movie about not just one Spider-Man, not just two Spider-Man, but five, six, seven Spider-Men and women? Six Spider-Men. Six Spider-Men. All right. Again, thank you for fact-checking. I um, just looked at the... Oh, I know. <laughs> um, Aiden, I'm right here. Yeah. I'm here with you. I can see you. Cool. Which people could, too, if they watched the YouTube. Shameless plug number one of the day. Oh. Oh, yeah. I'm getting real gross about it. Um, yeah. Into the Spider-Verse, a movie where Kingpin creates a particle accelerator or a... I forget what the other word for it is, but a thing that will tear into other dimensions. Uh, and in the process of doing so, brings alternate universe Spider-Man into a universe where Peter Parker has recently died, and he dies trying to stop this particle accelerator. While that's happening, another another guy, sorry, Miles Morales, Miles Morales of Ultimates Comics fame, and now just general Spider-Man fame, gets bitten by a similar spider to Spider-Man, and starts developing his powers where he meets the alternate universe versions of himself and Peter Parker. and. And Stacy and a whole bunch of others, and learns to be Spider Man and be the Spider Man for his universe, which is a really good PRE way of defining what this movie is, but also really well sums up what it is. Uh, and it's great. It's so good. It's so good. All of us love this. Yes. Um, for different reasons. You know, I love it because Gwen Stacy is in a movie, and that's all I care about and value in media. But I know you have your other reasons that are, you know, more valid. Right. I mean, mine is just that I like Miles in media, so. All right, well, Antonio, both of us are shallow and have no taste. You have to help the show out. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I, I really liked <laughs> I Into know. the Spider-Verse because, you know, it it was like the Lego Batman movie, but for Spider-Man, like kind of how we got all these really cool references. There were just so many things going on. As a lifetime Spider-Man fan, it was really great to see all of that on the screen. But on top of that, at the same time, like, there were so many surprises. They did different things. And like we were discussing earlier, it didn't necessarily stick to a storyline past the origin, and it kind of just went in its own direction. And I really liked that because it felt really fresh. And I think it's safe to say that this isn't just one of the best animated movies of the year. It's not just one of the best superhero movies of the year, but it's one of the best movies of the year. And I think this will go down as a really good like change in the superhero genre. And I was really, really pleased with it what they put together, especially after Venom. Yeah. yeah. Well, and th this movie feels genuine in a way that I think a lot of other big budget superhero movies don't, at least to me, where the emotional beats that this movie focuses on are well developed and well rounded, mm -hmm. even though they cram so many right. of them into a sub two hour runtime. Um, you have Miles' relationship with his dad, his relationship with his uncle, and that's tied together. You have the backstory for all of the other Spider-Men, some of which are more developed than others. Uh, old Peter, voiced by Jake Johnson, 
gets more time because he's like the mentor figure. He's mm -hmm. the Obi-Wan Kenobi figure in Miles' life. And you get to hear about his relationship with Mary Jane and his universe breaking down. And then you hear about Gwen Stacy's relationship with her Peter collapsing in a monstrous way. You know, you get all of those details. Even Kingpin has a motivation for why he's doing it that goes beyond, I like science and I like mm -hmm. to destroy things, which is great. Um, and it feels earned in a really solid way because the movie places priority on emotions over crazy action, even though it delivers on that too. Yeah. Yeah, I would say this movie, you were talking about how you liked all the references. I enjoyed them a lot, too. Uh, I think with a movie, it's really easy to fall down a hole of references. Yes. Uh, We've seen it happen in multiple movies in the past like, couple of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The more that nerd culture becomes like a very dominant force within popular culture, the more a lot of studios are like, well, <laughs> if we just put all the things in it, then people will love it, right? And uh, a lot of times, uh, no, it's, it's awful. Um, and what uh, sort of what Jake was talking about this movie it was smart to a enlist uh, Lord and Miller because they are so good at f zeroing in on all right we can have all this fun and we can be you know we can wink at the audience but none of that will matter if there is not a a core theme and a core character journey um, to this movie in the Jump Street movies it's a lot about the relationship with Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum uh, in the Lego movie it's all about Emmett and in this one it focuses on Miles and his relationship with eight different mentor figures uh, and I love that about Miles because uh, we're going to talk later about more about Miles specifically as a character but one of the things that I do love about Miles is that he doesn't exist in a vacuum he exists in a world where Spider-Man ar already exists and was beloved uh, they hired Chris Pine because Chris Pine is the coolest sounding dude and he just like if you don't see like his smarmy facial expressions and you just hear his voice in isolation, God, he seems perfect. And so even in this world, Miles has a lot to, you know, both has uh, a lot to live up to uh, as far as the public perception, but also uh, he has this almost cautionary figure in the older Peter uh, showing him maybe where he can go wrong. Um, and the same is sort of mirrored with his dad and, and his uncle. Uh, and so there's a lot of smart, thematic, economic storytelling that you generally don't see outside of, honestly, animated movies because they have these large incubation periods where they can really zero in on, on what is our theme, uh, how, can we, how can we express this theme through the story, and is there fluff, is there stuff that, we, that isn't a funny or be serving a character, okay, cut it, cut it before we animate it. And I think that's a, a great thing about a lot of animated movies like this that were given a lot of time to develop is that they don't have problems like that. So this movie moves. This it, movie is a tight two yeah. hours. It, it is, and it covers, like we said, a lot of ground, introducing a ton of characters. Because on top of these Spider-Men and Spider-Women that you have in you know the poster behind us, you also have the villains that they put into this movie too. And they give themselves even more work because the villains that they put into this movie aren't the typical versions of these characters. So you have Kingpin, who is more or less himself. That's yeah. standard. The biggest we've ever seen him. Huge, just a <laughs> yeah, big just for brick no reason. wall. Brick <laughs> of a man. Yeah. Oh, well yes, because the animation style of this movie, which is very psychedelic and kind of comic book inspired, like it kind of looks I like a comic book I would say style. so. There's yeah. a lot of cell shading and, and 2D animated art. And listen, I don't think they would have been able to do a quarter of the things that they accomplished with this movie if it was live action. And I'm really glad that Sony was able to realize that if they want to tell stories like this, animation is the way to go. And they Absolutely. really, really proved that with this movie. And as we've seen in our live action movies, they, I, oh, I don't even want to imagine what a live action in the Spider-Man universe would look like if it was produced by Sony. Well, but you don't yeah. have to imagine we're going to get it. I know. It. It's going to be I so know. Fun. And I don't want to think about it. Yeah. No. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Because, again, we've talked about Venom on this show. You and I talked yes. about Venom on this show or complained about Venom on this show. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Which, at least to me, feels like a joyless movie. Right. Um, even though it's... Mm, Tom Hardy is, is joyous. The rest of the movie is joyless. But Tom Hardy is joyous. Aiden, I refuse to talk about this again. <laughs> okay, fine. It fine, actively fine, causes me pain. Okay, fine. Um, I'm sorry. I don't mean to bad talk something you love or like. I or, love Tom Hardy. No, he loves mostly. doing that. He's lying. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> we don't have time for this. Okay. Um, Spider-Man is a very joyful character. Absolutely. And this is right. a very joyful movie. Um... Again, it makes time for serious moments, but it's also very fun. You know, you get to see Miles living his daily life and going about even doing normal things for him, even when he's walking down the street and throwing stickers up on walls. It's this really fun, kinetic experience that 
translates later on when he's actually swinging around the city. Um, and we get a whole long scene of that towards the end of the movie when he it's, finally becomes Spider-Man. Yeah, it's the only scene in a Spider-Man movie where it's just exclusively, hey, let's watch him swing for a bit. And it doesn't really like lead to anything necessarily. Like you could have just been like, all right, he's here now, like he's at the final place. But they take time out to be like, watch in like gorgeous technicolor, like this scene of him swinging around. I mean, this is a movie that starts with a song called Sunflower. Like it's a just a charming delight. It's very cute. Uh, and the way they used Sunflower in this movie was great, how they started with it. He was like singing along to the song and not like getting the words correctly. It, it's the first thing you yeah. see from him, and it is mm -hmm. the most endearing way you can yeah. introduce someone to And it character. ends with it too, yeah, which it's is great. great, really great. Well, again, because there's a, a central idea and like storytelling techniques. No, it's like so Sony like actually learned something, but. I think it's, they just knew to hire the right people. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I don't, I feel well, like. Also, Sony Pictures Animation is different studio than Sony Pictures, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe that has something to do with it. But I think Lord and Miller were really the people who went in there and like, okay, here's how we're gonna do this. And also the three directors, I don't wanna discount their work. I don't know their names, unfortunately, because there were three of them. Uh, but they were, they're all people that have had very long careers in the animation industry. Uh, mm -hmm. These are very accomplished directors. Um, and they do a great job. Like, you know, I don't want to just say, like, this is the Lord and Miller movie because they didn't direct it. Yeah. Um, but I think you can definitely see a lot of their, um, their sure. sort, of, for, sort of work in here. Yeah. And uh, you feel decades of comic history in here, too, I know in a way that doesn't feel gross. I mean, there are the obvious yeah. homages when each character is introduced. They give them a comic intro where it flips through a comic as they tell you who they are and how they were bitten by a spider and how you know their relationships in their world work and how they got into Miles' universe. I find it fascinating that none of, because a lot of those are very reference-y, like they reference like the Tobey Maguire movies, there was even like a visual reference to Homecoming. Um, no references to The Amazing Spider-Man. Oh, I wonder why. Yeah, <laughs> it's, just, it, yeah. it's very, it wasn't even like a, like a quick thing, which I don't know, there's good elements to those movies, but I guess, yeah. I think it's less that they're hated, they're just forgotten. Yeah. Like, I think they just didn't leave a like, cultural impact enough that well, they could comment on yeah. it. To go on this tangent real quick, it's because the first movie is a perfectly adequate like start with good actors giving good performances right. of these characters. It's like the most like in the middle movie ever. You and know? It's in the pocket. And, yeah. and that's okay, because I feel the same way about Batman Begins and a lot of other starts right. of series. You could get away with that if yeah. you set something up good. But Batman Begins had the Dark Knight after it. <laughs> Amazing Spider-Man 1 had Amazing Spider-Man 2, oh which is one of the most heinous things to ever appear yeah, on the cinema screen. I agree. <laughs> yeah. I think besides Suicide Squad, I've never been more angry walking out of a theater. Like, I was genuinely an angry person walking out of Amazing Spider-Man 2. So. I was a very angry person watching out Batman v Superman, but that's... Again, we, we, we have that. dedicated a lot of time to that. Yeah, Deservedly yeah. so. Yep. Um, and I want to give us a chance to be happy because this show is so rarely a happy place. I know. We all feel happy about it. And that, oh, especially yeah. with you as the host. Very rare to, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Antonio, this is the month of dreams. And I knew it would be. I know uh, that's not necessarily mm -hmm. true. I knew it would be two weeks of dreams because we okay. have Wreck-It Ralph 2, right. which I love. We have Marvelous Miss Maisel season two, which I love. And then we had this, which was the movie I was most excited for this year oh. since, well, yeah, since I saw Gwen Stacy appear on screen right. and I just knew my life was complete. Um, and everything lived up to what I thought it would be or exceeded expectations in the case of Wreck-It Ralph, which was a nice surprise for the end of the year. I think one thing we haven't talked about enough is the supporting cast of this movie. We talked a lot about about how Miles and older Peter and Gwen work as a thematic uh, beats, but most of the comedy doesn't come from them. Uh, at least most of the, the best comedy beats come from Spider-Man Noir, played by Nicolas Cage in his best performance outside of Mandy, uh, John Mulaney as Spider-Ham in his only effective acting appearance uh, in his career, uh, where, but he's incredible in this movie, he's so funny, uh, and Spider, uh, SP slash slash DR uh, as the cute anime Penny Parker uh, version where she's in like a big big old robot suit and that uh, even that has a really effective emotional scene. I'm gonna disagree with you on effective. That is one of the things in this movie that I liked least when her robot dies. Oh and, yeah, I didn't like that either. And I'm, I'm not sitting there. I, I wasn't into it. She was probably no. like my least favorite out of the whole cast, but she had the Nicolas Cage in this movie was great. Every time he spoke, I was like, wow, 
this is amazing. Like it, when they introduced him and they're like, why is he black and light, white? Like we're inside, like why is the wind blowing? He's like, the wind blows wherever I go. <laughs> and then the match, you know, he's like, I'll burn the matches down to my fingers to feel something. He's great. He's it's terrific. amazing. It's, it's a great like tease at edgy characters. Yeah. Oh at, yeah. Edgy for the sake of edgy. So every Batman movie or Batman piece of media that's existed for the last couple of years. Yeah. And I mean, Talk about like using characters who have never actually been that good. Like Spider-Man Noir was introduced in a video game, uh, uh, Shattered Dimensions, um, and since then has never been given a lot of depth because the whole idea is, what if Spider-Man was a hard-boiled cop? And this movie went, that's a dumb idea. Like it's a bad pitch. And he just laughed at it the whole time. Oh yeah, yeah, and it just has the most fun with it, and that's and that's great because this movie is both very faithful but not precious like this movie you see spider-man die and there is a funeral uh, and it's a very great funeral scene but there's a joke immediately mm -hmm. you know once it once it ends um, and I and I like that about this movie yeah. um, I, I, I want to roll back on something there for a second there's a lot of death in this movie it's there dark. is yeah. yeah Peter Peter Parker played by Chris Pine dies um, the Prowler, who is we didn't really talk about, which is really a shame. Uh, Mahershala so Ali as great character, Miles' uncle, yeah, yeah, dies, gets shot in the back. Um, Kingpin's parents or parents, uh, his wife, and wife and son. child die. Yeah, and then we get one other death in there too, and I'm forgetting. But I'm not counting the robot. That's not real. And then we hear about <laughs> um, Gwen's Peter dying, Peter, too. Right. Yeah. turning uh, into oh. a monster and dying. Yeah, and um, and even uh, Peter's Aunt May uh, in his alternate right. reality, right. and that's mine for a very effective scene where he meets Aunt May, and that is one of the two scenes that I got very choked up on, and because this is a really effective movie um, with you know great either comedic performances or Brian Tyree Henry doing incredible work as uh, as Miles' dad. Like, he's a younger man, but he is, I, I didn't even think about like, oh, that's the guy from Atlanta. Like, the entire time I was just like, that is Miles' dad. Uh, and he's so incredible in this movie. Um, he's probably one of my favorite characters, actually. Oh, he's great, yeah. Uh, Shamik Moore, um, who should be mentioned because he's great on the get down. He's a great young actor. Um, he's great in uh, Dope. Uh, and he is just a great actor, yeah. uh, and I'm glad that he's, you know, it's not, this is not his big star-making turn because it's a voice acting performance, but hopefully this is not the last, like, huge movie because I think he's awesome in this movie. Yeah, I mean, consistently, the, the voice acting in this movie is top-notch because they got slightly lesser-known actors to play really well-done characters. I would say, what, I mean, Nicolas Cage, but he's a joke to most people. Mm -hmm. Haley Steinfeld, Steinfeld is sort is, of I think, trendy. Yeah. She's, yeah. she's getting up there, yeah. She, she's she's going to be in Bumblebee in like a week, and that, that's right. going to be her big the breakup. The biggest person in this movie, besides maybe Leif Shriver, but again, of like the main yeah. cast, she's the biggest person in this movie. Leif but it's also the and. No. <laughs> I, I don't have the energy for this. <laughs> there are solid voice performances backed up by really interesting characters, and I think Miles is chief among them. Um, mm -hmm. And we're going to camp out on him for a little bit because I really want to talk about how they adapt him for this movie. And we're going to do that in this next segment coming up right here. OK, it's time to talk about Miles Morales, a character who is having a fantastic year in media uh, between Into the Spider-Verse and the video game, which yes. he's featured prominently in. and. Spoilers for that too. Has the best after the credit scene in anything I've ever seen. But oh, that's, that's not great. about this. Yeah, um, well, I thought you were talking about this movie. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we, we missed our chance to talk about the wonderful use of memes at the end of this. Yeah. Um, but oh, we need to focus on Miles, and we touched on him briefly because I think this is a perfect, a perfect character to tell this story and to follow Peter. I guess he's been around for. 10 years right. almost now? Uh, he was introduced in 2011, so he's seven years old. Okay. Which so, is amazing to think about, too, right? Like, oh, he's such yeah. a new character. I mean, he was yeah. immediately iconic, I would say. Like, the second, like, that, it, part of it is that it, his costume is great. They, they, ad, they did a really good adaptation of his costume to match the whole thematic bit of him uh, being a graffiti artist. Um, but both versions of the costume, I feel like, are just very visually striking, and so that's part of it. But also, he's just such an interesting character. Like, it's good that he's basically now had like two cultural moments, both when he was introduced and now, you know, now having his own movie. I, yeah, I mean, he's one of my favorite characters in comics. Well, because he is relatable, and that sounds really simple and dumb to say. Yeah. But the whole conceit of Spider-Man is that Spider-Man is an everyman. Um, and even more so with Miles, because it starts off with him like, like singing along to a song and he doesn't know the words, and like, yeah, that, yeah it's just relatable and like. I don't know. I thought the part that I liked the most was that 
they were able to introduce Miles Morales as the new Spider-Man and that he was a really good character. But even though they killed off Peter Parker in the first 15 minutes, they still didn't have to like undermine his character. So they were Peter Parker's a great character, but we also have a great character with Miles Morales and with Gwen Stacy and all these other characters. I really like that because I'm a fan of Peter Parker and I didn't want them to just like, oh, we could just like throw this under the rug for now and focus on Miles. But no, they did a really good job like showing that Miles was a great character while also focusing on the other characters. I mean, and I think it's important that Miles was created by a writer, Brian Michael Bendis, who mm -hmm. wrote Peter Parker's Spider-Man for uh, like 12 years before he decided to kill him off and introduce Miles. So yeah, th Miles is not a character that's pointedly going like, no, no, forget the past. One of the things that's great about Miles is that he doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, you're talking about how he's relatable. I think I love Peter, but also he's a super genius and and as time go, goes on, it's almost harder to hold on to that element where it's like, oh, I'm just a relatable guy, but like I have a super nice apartment in Queens and like I go to this nice fancy tech school. Or even I'm a super genius, but I'm constantly poor. It's like one of the longest running jokes of Spider-Man. Yeah. Is he can develop technology to rival Tony Stark and he has to ask Aunt May for $100 to pay his rent. Um, it, yeah. And the... And you know, credit to the to the video game, which does do that effectively. But generally, most of the time, yeah, Peter ends up being caught in this weird space where a lot of things that make him unique as a character also take him away from that everyman quality. And I think part of the benefit of Miles being such a new character is all the focus can be put into, all right, what are things that are relatable? What are things that are fresh and new? And one of the things is Miles is constantly trying to live up to a reputation where I was, you know, we mentioned earlier that Chris Pine seemed to be this perfect Spider-Man, and now he has to live up to that in the comics when he first puts on the suit. Everyone's constantly remarking like, hey, this seems an awful taste. I, like, I get that you have the powers, but dude. Uh, and so he needs to develop his own suit and his own identity, despite the fact that he's still called Spider-Man. Um, and I think that's part of the thing that's great about Spider about Miles is that, you know, the Miles is a character, and the people that create Miles and write for Miles are aware that everyone likes Peter, uh, and he has to live up to that, and that gives him an everyman quality, and that he's almost like stuck under the shadow of this character. And I think this movie is such a great coming out party for him, um, where they use his special powers and the things that make him unique as indications of his emotions, where when he's scared, he turns invisible, and when he's feeling powerful or even scared, he's able to shock people. And eventually, he's able to uh, control his emotions, and you see that like thematically through his ability to control his powers. And I think, like one, that's just like great storytelling, um, but two, I like that it took an element of the comics that I never actually liked about Miles, where it's like, oh, what is Miles going to do? He's going to use his Venom Blast, and, it's, and, the, and the confrontation's over. Like, when you're, writing a Miles, uh, when you're writing a Miles Morales action scene, you sort of, sort of have to just forget that he has that power for, like, two pages, so, like, some cool stuff is going to happen before he just takes him down. Uh, and so even the elements of Miles that aren't very effective are great in this. Well, what do you mean? Like, which ones? The or Venom the Blast, namely, yeah. namely the Venom Blast yeah. uh, is a great adjustment to yeah. make. And then they adapt some of what I think are the best parts of Miles, which is his family dynamic. Oh my god, yeah. His, his mom less so, but you get a lot from his dad, like you mentioned, and then you get a lot from his uncle, who's the Prowler. Yeah. And they set that up so well. Like, obviously, oh, sorry, that was about to sound, I was about to sound like the worst comic nerd ever. <laughs> obviously, I knew who the Prowler was. Um, <laughs> you, you, if you've read the comics, you know that turn before it happens, but yes. it's still very tense, even as Miles figures out who he is, and even as Aaron figures out who Miles is, and he confronts him uh, and can't kill him but has to. And eventually I really liked how death. he Miles' dad originally thought that Spider-Man killed his brother, but then at the end of the movie when he saw it like being like a heroic moment, he was like, oh, I thought I knew who killed him, but I was wrong. And that was like a really cool moment because he hated Spider-Man for the whole movie. And at the end, he kind of turned around. Char characters are able to change yes. and recognize Spider-Man in this world, which I think is a really wonderful thing mm -hmm. um, in a movie full of them. And I wish we had more time to talk about it, but we don't. So I'm going to be back in a second to give a little rant about something I'm passionate about. But for now, this is the end of you guys. Thanks for coming on. Where can people find you? I'm on Twitter at alens98. Um, if you want to know more about paganism on campus, uh, <laughs> then uh, I have a story about that that, uh, that I co-wrote. So you can check that out on theithigan.com. And I'm Antonio Fermi. You could follow me at Antonio underscore Fermi on Twitter. And uh, I write a lot of stuff for The Ithigan as well, so you could go check that out.
Thank you both very much. Hopefully you'll be back sometime soon. I won't, Jake. <laughs> but this is really sad. This is probably our last podcast for like a long time, maybe a year. You're, so. you're depressing me, so I'm going yeah. to cut you off <laughs> 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 and, say, and say stay tuned for a little rant. Um, and thank you both. All right, we're going to wrap up this talk of what I think is a visually beautiful movie and a storyline vi visually, oh no, a storyline beautiful movie with a little talk about why I think in the broader context of culture this is also a really relevant and beautiful thing. Um, because it adapts a character that everybody knows, Peter Parker, Spider-Man, and shows that anyone can be Spider-Man, and they say that very directly at the end of the movie. You know, this movie is about showing what Spider-Man can mean by having it be Gwen Stacy, or having it be a grown man, or having it be a half black, half Puerto Rican kid uh, from Brooklyn. Like it, it shows, or Queens, I can't remember, somewhere in New York. It shows just how broad the definition of a superhero can mean and how that can change over time, which is something we hear about a lot in comics as comic book fans, whenever casting rumors go around and people are saying, oh, Idris Elba should be S Superman, and people lose their minds and freak out because that's not what they know and it's not what they're comfortable with, even though the definition of a superhero is very broad. And even though we get a lot of pushback from that, we now finally have a movie that directly attacks that idea and directly shows you how stupid and simple-minded that is. Because Miles gets to be his own character and he gets to present something different while still representing the ideals that Peter Parker embodied, and that's something we talked about a little bit before, that he is that everyman, but he's even more of an everyman because now more people can identify with him. You know, there's a whole other audience that has a superhero that didn't have one before and has one of the biggest superheroes. Everybody knows Spider-Man, and now everybody gets to know Miles Morales, and I think that's so wonderful. That's such an amazing moment just in terms of culture and in terms of movies and in terms of the way characters can grow and change. And in a year that has Black Panther, um, it's really nice to see another movie that can exist in that same space. And with that said, we're going to wrap up this show, uh, and we're going to wrap up this season of shows, because we are going to go and take winter break, because this is a college podcast, and we can't be here over Christmas. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for watching, you know, all 100 people, whoever you are, who watch the show every week. It really does mean a lot that there's somebody out there who wants to watch us goof off. Um, and I also want to take a brief heartfelt moment to thank the producer who has been on this show for the last two semesters, Nick Friend, who isn't going to be with us next semester. He's still alive. That sounds very morbid. He's still here, but he's going to go on and do uh, bigger and better things, and this show really couldn't be what it is without him. So I wanted to thank him and thank our entire crew, because a lot goes into making a show where we start off by making thwip thwip sounds like Spider-Man. Um, and again, that's really important. If you want to follow me anywhere, you can at JD underscore Leary on Twitter. That's not anywhere. That would actually be really creepy. Please don't follow me everywhere. Uh, and you can read anything I write on the Ithacan or at Ground Punch, another lovely little site where I post a lot of superhero or video game related content. And that's going to be it for us. You know, I don't know what the show is going to look like when it comes back in January, but I'm hoping we're able to keep what we have going. And I just want to thank everybody who's out there watching it and making it. It's meant a lot. I promise I won't cry. I have another few seconds of ending this show. Thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for listening. I'm Jay Cleary. This is Deja Vu.